This is going to be the most transformational moment, not just in technology, but in culture and politics of all of our lifetimes. Welcome to Radio Davos, the podcast from the World Economic Forum that looks at the biggest challenges and how we might solve them. This week, three pioneers of AI on where this technology will take us next. Those systems will understand the physical world, which is not the case for current systems. They will be able to remember, which is not the case for current systems. And they will be able to reason and plan, which is also not the case for current systems. We'll have systems that are much smarter than they currently are, and we'll have far more applications whose consequences are really hard to predict. This AI pioneer describes how it feels to have a eureka moment when you achieve a real breakthrough in technology. It could actually speak language, which nothing could really do before that. That was their eureka moment. These experts working on the cutting edge can help the rest of us understand what generative AI really is. It's difficult to explain. I think there's a lot of pieces of it that are counterintuitive, um, how simple it is the setup. And they tell us their hopes and fears. When we look back at history, at all of the major general purpose technologies that have transformed our world, there's a very consistent characteristic, which is to the extent that things get useful, they get cheaper, they get easier to use, and they spread far and wide to everybody, good and quote unquote bad. Subscribe to Radio Davos wherever you get your podcasts or visit weft.ch slash podcasts where you'll also find our sister programs Meet the Leader and Agenda Dialogues. I'm Robin Pomer at the World Economic Forum and with three AI pioneers. This may be a new renaissance for humanity. This is Radio Davos. Aidan Gomez was just 20 years old when he co-authored a research paper that proposed a novel neural network technique called the Transformer that would learn relationships between long strings of data. Transformer is the T in chat GPT, which stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. Mustafa Suleiman co-founded DeepMind, an AI company acquired by Google, and he also wrote the bestseller The Coming Wave on the future of humanity shaped by AI and bioengineering. Yann Lecun is chief AI scientist at Meta and a professor at New York University. He's one of a handful of people referred to as the godfathers of AI. These three, all of them in Time magazine's top 100 most powerful people in AI, were among the many AI luminaries at this year's annual meeting in Davos. And in this episode, they will tell us about the past, present and future of AI. Let's start with Aidan Gomez. I'm Aidan Gomez. I'm one of the co-founders of Cohere, and we build large language models for enterprise. You must come across people who really don't know how generative AI works. Do you have a set kind of elevator pitch of, oh yeah, this is how it works, or is that impossible to do? It's difficult to explain. I think there's a lot of pieces of it that are counterintuitive, um, how simple it is, the setup. You basically collect a ton of data. We're talking billions of web pages from the internet. And then you teach the model to rewrite that data or to uh, predict the next word in a sentence. Um, And just by doing that simple task, you end up learning to do incredible things, you know, reasoning, the ability to translate, the ability to write code, all of that data is out there on the web. And so just by training on it, getting the model to regenerate that data, uh, to learn to create it, it's able to learn to do very complex tasks. Did you have a eureka moment when you were getting into this? Was there, was there one particular moment where you went, right, that's it, I've really found something here? The past, uh, I guess it would be eight years for me, it's been a series of eureka moments. There's no one particular one. There was a first one, uh, and that might have been around the success of deep learning in neural networks. So this architecture that's inspired by the brain. Uh, that takes inspiration from the thing that we know works, right, inside our head. Um, That was probably the first moment that I felt inspired and I felt like we were on the critical path. How how did you know it was working? I mean, what was, you know, you think of the invention of TV Mm -hmm. and they got something to appear on a screen Mm -hmm. (laughs) from a distance. You're inputting something into this neural network and you're getting something out, what, what, what was it that came out the other end? You thought, oh, that's working. Well, I, I think, you know, early days, it was much more, it was much simpler than what we have today. Um, so it was classification. It was the ability to look at an image and know what's inside the image and tell you that. And at some point we had machines which were better at recognizing objects than humans were. Humans would make more mistakes than the machine. And so that was a a very strong proof point that we can get to the level of human performance 
in a specific domain that's very narrow, right? Classifying things that are in, in images. I think for this more general AI that we're seeing today, the moment came when you, you know, I got this email from my collaborator who was a co-author, Lukasz Kaiser on the, on the Transformer paper. Um, and it was like, look at this. It was a Wikipedia article. The title was The Transformer. And then it started talking about this Japanese punk rock band that had gotten together, broken up, the basis had gone over here. And at the very bottom, Lukash had written, um, you know, I just wrote the transformer, the machine wrote the rest. And so that was like a surreal moment where you saw a machine speaking as fluently that it convinced me I was reading an article about Japanese punk rock band. And so that that was their eureka moment for large well, language. That, that band didn't exist? No, it made it all up. Yeah, yeah. So it, it was, but it was so fluent. It was so, like it could actually speak language. Right. Which nothing could really do before that. I think that's probably an experience that, you know, the civilians have had over the last year or so with, with ChatGPT and other applications. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow, we've not had this experience of being talked to by a, by a machine like that. Yeah, and it's it's way better than what I saw back then. It's It's much more correct, accurate, factual. Um, and it's able to do more. So those models that we were building, they were just good at writing fake Wikipedia pages. Now these models can do a lot of, a lot of really interesting, tough stuff. Right. What is either a tangible thing or something way in the future? What's the thing that really excites you? The thing you've, that you'll be able to do using Gen AI? Is there something like, well, when I can do that, it will be amazing. You know, for me, I think transforming productivity, uh, it's not super hyped up and people don't talk about it a lot, but it's so impactful. Like take one example, um, doctors. I, I think they spent something like 40% of their working hours writing notes. And if we could give them 40% of their days back to spend with patients, focus on patient outcomes, it, it means we basically double the number of doctors effectively. Overnight. And humanity is so supply constrained in these sorts of professions. If we're able to ease that supply constraint, humans live longer, they live better lives, we save lives. Um, and so I think that's, it's not spoken about as this hypey, exciting it's thing. It's not but, science fiction, is it? No, it's real. It's, it's here. Productivity it's here. gains, but it's yeah. a great answer. Yeah. Um, and what's the converse of that? Is there something that really scares you about the development of Gen AI? Yeah, I think this year, you know, the, the world is going to see a lot of elections. Um, and I'm very concerned about what this technology can do uh, in terms of shifting the public conversation. Uh, you can very scalably insert a bunch of bots, which are completely indistinguishable from humans, but either make it look like an idea is more popular than it actually is, or skew conversations in a desired direction. So I, I think that's, that's something we all need to be vocally calling to build technology to stop. There, there is technology that can help prevent this. For instance, the social media platforms, they're almost all implementing human verification. So you can now see that the person at the other end of the screen has verified as a human. You know you're talking to another voting citizen of the earth. Um, I think there needs to be more of that. Uh, and that needs to be more aggressively pursued because this technology does make astroturfing dramatically easier. Aidan Gomez, co-founder of Cohere, we'll hear more from him in a later episode of Radio Davos focusing on the governance of AI. Astroturfing, by the way, is creating a fake campaign to make it look like something has widespread grassroots support. Now, if you're looking for a primer in AI, you could do worse than get a copy of The Coming Wave by Mustafa Suleiman. He spoke on a panel session at Davos and, as in his book, makes a strong case for the transformational power of AI. This is going to be the most transformational moment, not just in technology, but in culture and politics of all of our lifetimes, right? We're going to witness the plummeting cost of power. AI is really the ability to absorb vast amounts of information, generate new kinds of information, and take actions on that information. Just like any organization, whether it's a government or a company or any individual, that's how we all interact in the world. 
And we're commoditizing, that is like reducing the cost of producing and distributing that tool. Ultimately, you'll be widely available to everybody, potentially in open source and in other forms. And that is going to be massively destabilizing. So whichever way you look at it, there are incredible upsides. And there's also the potential to empower everybody to be able to, you know, essentially conflict in the way that we otherwise might because we have different views and opinions in the world. One of the obvious characteristics of this new wave is that these tech, these tools are omni-use. Like dual use doesn't really sort of cut it anymore. They're inherently useful in so many different settings. And actually, when we look back at history at all of the major general purpose technologies that have transformed our world, there's a very consistent characteristic, which is to the extent that things get useful, they get cheaper, they get easier to use, and they spread far and wide. So we have to assume that that's gonna be the continued destiny over the next couple of decades and manage the consequences of power, the ability right. to take actions becoming cheaper and widely available to everybody, good right. and quote unquote bad. In his book, The Coming Wave, Mustafa Suleiman talks about the Turing test, a long-standing way of testing a machine's ability to appear to have human level intelligence. Named after the British computer scientist Alan Turing, who proposed it in 1950, the Turing test looks at whether a machine can answer questions in a way that is indistinguishable from the answers a human would give. As that test is pretty much now met by the AI chatbots available to all of us, Suleiman suggests in his book an updated Turing test that would test the capability of an AI system not just to appear to be intelligent, but to achieve a tangible complex task. He suggests the following prompt. Go make $1 million on Amazon in a few months with just a $100,000 investment. Here he is again speaking on that session at Davos that was called Hard Power of AI. We've had the Turing test for over 70 years and the goal was try and imitate human conversation and persuade a human that you are in fact human, not an AI. And it turns out we're pretty close to passing that. Maybe we have in some settings, it's unclear, but it's definitely no longer a useful test. So I think the right test, the modern Turing test, would be to try to evaluate whether an AI was capable of acting like a an entrepreneur, like a mini project manager, an inventor of a new product, go and market it, manufacture it, sell it, and so on, and make a profit. I'm pretty sure that within the next five years, certainly before the end of the decade, we are going to have not just those capabilities, but those capabilities widely available for very cheap, potentially even in open source. Mm. I think that completely changes the economy. Mustafa Suleiman, co-founder of Inflection AI and author of The Coming Wave. You can hear that whole conversation, which includes many other very interesting people on AI, on the session at Davos on our sister program, which is called Agenda Dialogues, and the session was called Hard Power of AI. Our third wise man in this episode of Radio Davos is Jan Le Kun, a fascinating figure who often speaks out against the hype surrounding AI. So when my colleague Colm Quinn sat down with him in Davos, he gave a measured response to the question, how will AI reshape industry over the next decade? My name is uh, Jan Le Kun, uh, since we are on this side of the pond. I am chief AI scientist at Meta and I'm a professor at New York University. How will generative AI reshape industries in the next decade? That's going to be a lot of reshaping over the next decade. And it's going to be due to, in part, to generative AI and in part to not generative AI. So the current thing that everybody is talking about is generative AI for text or images and soon for video as well as music, uh, this is going to make people more creative, more people more creative, because it's uh, uh, a new way of creating things, right? And uh, it will help people who don't necessarily have the technique to, to be creative in various ways. Uh, of course, it will help business a lot. Um, a lot of professions uh, where you need to write things um, will be helped by uh, generative systems that are fluent in language. Um, so that's kind of the short term. It will make a lot of people more efficient and more creative. Um, but then there is the longer term, and the longer term is those systems are going to become smarter and smarter, and they, their architecture is going to be different. They, they're not going to be the type of autoregressive large language models that we uh, have become used to over the last year. Um, they'll probably be on a different blueprint, and those systems will understand the physical world, which is not the case for current systems. They will be able to remember, which is not the case for current systems. And they will be able to reason and plan, which is also not the case for current systems. So once we get to this breakthroughs, which will occur over the next few years, 
we'll have systems that are much, much smarter than they currently are. And we'll have far-ranging applications whose consequences are really hard to predict. AI that understands the physical world. Speculating for a second, I mean, what, what do you think that might be? So first, I, I need to tell you, why is it that current systems don't understand the physical world? And, and why current AI systems are very, very far from matching the type of intelligence and learning abilities that we observe in humans and animals. Um, and the, the, the reason for this is that language is, is not a complete um, representation of, uh, of the world. Most of what we learn as babies is from interaction with the physical world. It's not from, from text. We, we think text is really contains all of human knowledge, but it, it, it's not true. Most of our knowledge in our, in, our, in our minds is actually from our interaction with the physical world. And the reason is very simple. If you take a large language model, it's trained on the entire text of the public internet, which is roughly 10 trillion words. I mean, it's tokens, but it's like words, right? Uh, each token is about two bytes. So that's two with 13 zeros behind it, uh, bytes that you train those systems on. And you imagine it's an incredible amount of information because it would take you or me somewhere between 150,000 and 200,000 years to just read through this, okay? So it's unfathomable how big it is. But then you compute how much information gets into the, the visual cortex of a four-year-old by the time that four-year-old is four. And uh, a four-year-old has been awake for 16,000 hours and you multiply by 3,600 you know, seconds per hour and 20 megabytes per, per second, roughly going through your optical nerve. And that's uh, 10 to the 15 bytes. That's 50 times more. By the time a child is four years old, he or she has seen 15 times more information through vision than the biggest of our LLMs. And so the amount of knowledge that's, you know, baked into this data is enormous. It's much bigger, actually, than what's in, uh, in text. And we don't know how to do this for machines. We don't know how to get them to watch the world, you know, watch the world go by and learn how the world works and get common sense and, uh, you know, uh, intuitive physics and things like this. Um, that's the challenge of the next few years. And we're working on this. We don't know when the next breakthrough will occur. We're making progress. But uh, before we have something that can exploit this, uh, it might take a few years, perhaps longer. And then, but then we'll have systems that learn how the world works perhaps understand people and what drives them. And so those systems will be able to plan sequences of actions so as to satisfy particular goals, right? So you, you give them a goal, and then they can think about it and plan a sequence of actions that would satisfy this goal and also satisfy perhaps a number of guardrails that make the system safe. I call this objective-driven AI. I can't show you an example of it because it doesn't work yet, but... Um, but that's probably the future. And, and those systems will be controllable, safe. They will understand the world. They will remember this planning ability will allow them to reason all things that current systems cannot do. Uh, so we're still far from, you know, having really intelligent systems, but hopefully we'll have them. And then people will interact with those things on a, you know, daily basis. They're, they'll be in their smart glasses and your interface with the digital world will be a AI system. You've said before that everyone's interactions are going to be mediated by AI interaction. I mean, could you give us a sense of what that looks like in a, in a tangible sense? Okay, so currently we, we want to access information. You know, we have to choose which service, which service we use. We go on search engine, you know, we go on, you know, various social media um, or, or, you know, Wikipedia, whatever, right? Um, but you'll just have an assistant, you know, with you at all times. An assistant that knows you is your best digital friend, if you want, your, your personal assistant, which at some point will have the, you know, intelligence level of, of, of a human. Um, so we basically behave like a, like a human assistant or something close to this. So this is not for tomorrow. Right? This is going to take a while. Uh, but then, you know, you'll have your smart glasses and, you know, you'll be able to talk to it. Uh, it'll be able to e either answer by voice or, or, or by, through a display. Uh, and, uh, you know, be also able to interact with it through typing and everything. Um, I don't know if, you know, if you've seen the movie Her, the 10 year old movie from, you know, Spike Jones, it's kind of not a bad depiction of what this idea of, uh, uh, assistant will be. And then eventually those systems will become smarter than us. Uh, so it, it won't be like having an assistant. It'd be like having a staff of really smart people working with you, um, and sort of empower you and, you know, amplify human intelligence. So this, this may, cause everyone to become smarter as a, as a whole, you know, the combination of them and their 
uh, staff of virtual assistants, if you want. Um, and this may, this may be a new renaissance for humanity. What would you say are the most pressing ethical concerns <laughs> surrounding uh, generative AI? And how should companies be looking at this? Okay, a number of different things. You know, obvious benefits in all corners of industry, right? Things are, are going to change uh, over the next few years. So the idea that, you know, LLMs of the type we know now are the things that are going to continue to, to, to exist and bring all the, all the features of AI. That, that's wrong. Within a few years, there'll be different things. We'll interact with them in a similar way, but they'll be much more powerful. That's the first thing. Second thing is the platform for AI will need to be open source. Of course, there is a space for proprietary systems as well, but they'll need to be open source because they'll have to eventually constitute the repository of all human knowledge. And, uh, you cannot have a single private company uh, basically building those systems so that they represent the entire spectrum of languages, cultures, value systems, and center of interest. Um, so we're going to need to have a lot of relatively, may not, you know, not specialized, but like diverse uh, uh, sources of, of, of uh, I mean, AI platforms to provide people with diverse uh, sources of information. We can't have sort of a single source of information, right? Because if all of our uh, digital diet is mediated by a single AI system, right? What does that mean about, you know, cultural diversity and political opinions and stuff like that, right? So, um, so it's going to have to be diverse, which means the platforms, because they are so expensive to train, well, is, are going to have to be open source. So that's the stance that uh, Meta and pretty much the entire academic world and a lot of the startup world has, uh, and of course the VC world has employed uh, or has adopted. And also that a lot of uh, countries are embracing because they see open source AI platforms as the way of preserving their culture, basically, right? And, and have some level of AI sovereignty, if you want. Um, so my, my prediction is that um, it's going to be like the software infrastructure of the internet. It will have to be open source because that's the most efficient way for it to uh, disseminate everywhere in the world. Do you think that an open source approach poses sort of regulatory challenges, I guess, if, if it was to, you know, fall into the hands of a bad actor, let's say? Right. So that that's a, a very important debate that has been going on. Uh, the consensus that's emerging, um, which was not the case six months ago, is that everybody agrees that open source is a good thing. Um, and, and, you know, should be, should not be uh, regulated out of existence. Sure, you know, the bad guys can put their hands on it, but the way you protect against this is that you keep moving so the bad guys are not ahead of you, right? If, if you, if you regulate research and development, research and development will slow down and the bad guys will just catch up. I mean, they, they get access to it in, you know, in a way or another. If you stay ahead, you have countermeasures that are better than their, uh, attacks. And, you know, at Meta, we're very familiar with using AI as countermeasures against things like, you know, disinformation, hate speech, uh, uh, child exploitation, terrorist propaganda, you know, all the horrible things that people want to, to use, you know, uh, corruption of elections, things like that, right? I think, uh, the, the, the big question, uh, which is both a technological question, but more of a, uh, sort of industry and, 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 and standards question is how do you prevent, uh, um, deep fakes, basically, right? So these big elections coming up in the three largest democracies in the world, the US, India, Indonesia, and uh, a lot of politician, political candidates are, are scared of the fact that, you know, uh, we can produce fake videos of them saying things they never said. Now, they are somewhat detectable, but not completely. And so the industry has been talking about uh, kind of watermarking standards and things like that, but nothing has really emerged as a, as a technical solution to this. And the question as to whether what should be watermarked are AI generated content or whether it should be on, on the other hand, uh, authentic content. Um, if you want to watermark authentic content, um, and, and so indicate whether it's been doctored, uh, in sort of a heavy way or not, you need, you know, camera manufacturers on board. You need, uh, you know, all the video, manipulation software on board and, and things like that, then it's very difficult. Uh, you know, it's going to take a while before those things are, are put in place. So that, that's probably the, the, the short-term kind of biggest question of how you solve that problem. But I think also uh, the public is, is going to uh, learn that 
you know, there's some certain sources of information you can trust and others that you, you sh really should not. I mean, I think it's going to, what's going to happen is going to be a bit like, like, you know, uh, what happened with email, right? In the first days of email, you know, there was spam and then we have spam filters. And then people learn to ignore spam, right? They, you can tell it's spam just from the subject. And now modern, modern mail system just, you know, get rid of it before you even see it, right? And then there were scams, right? Uh, the, 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 we all know what the standard scams in email were. Uh, and people kind of learn to not click on everything, right? So I think it's going to be kind of a similar, uh, similar phenomenon, but like how long is it going to take? How many people are going to be captured by those, this fake content? What technical system would be put in place and how fast to protect against this? That's the big question. NYU professor Yann Lacan, chief AI scientist at Meta. Before him, you heard Mustafa Suleiman of Inflection AI and Aidan Gomez, co-founder of Cohere. There's a lot more on AI from Davos. Go to weft.ch slash weft24 and have a look around. Be sure to check out the World Economic Forum's AI Governance Alliance. Find that at weft.ch slash AIGA, all in capitals. We also have several podcast episodes on the subject. Find them all at weft.ch slash podcast or look on your podcast app for our shows Radio Davos, Meet the Leader and Agenda Dialogues. This episode of Radio Davos was presented by me, Robin Pomeroy, with additional reporting by Colm Quinn. Studio engineering in Davos was by Juan Toran and Edward Bally. Sound production was by Taz Kelleher. We'll be back next week, but for now, thanks to you for listening and goodbye. <laughs>